Hi, I'm Henry Farrell, and I am a uh, professor at Johns Hopkins University, where I'm jointly affiliated to the Stavros Niarchus uh, Foundation Institute, Agora Institute, and to Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies. And I'm here today to host the 18th episode of CASBIS's webcast series, Social Science for a World of Crisis. And I want to talk about the topic for today's, uh, for today's uh, webcast, which is high-tech modernism. But before I want to do that, I want to do two things. First of all, I want to acknowledge the partners for this episode who are Data and Society, the Essex Society and Technology Hub at Stanford, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and the Social Science Matrix at University of California at Berkeley. And secondly, I want to talk a little bit about the panelists. We have some wonderful panelists today. And uh, you ought, of course, to have read the detailed biographies, which were in the event promo. Uh, you uh, may or may not have done that, depending. If you haven't done that yet, you should go to the chat box where we will link to the event promo again so that you can see uh, in great detail what all of these panelists have done. And it is a varied and wonderful list because I'm not going to list that. I'm going to just give you a brief sense of who the uh, people are and why it is that they have important things to say about the topic of today's discussion. So first I'd like to begin with Dana Boyd. Dana is at Microsoft Research and she is also the founder of Data and Society, which she is still involved in via the board. And she has been thinking about data and the algorithmic society for a long, long time and has been doing wonderful and extraordinary work in this. And is also in the throes of writing a book on the US census, on the politics and social questions surrounding the census, which turn out to be incredibly uh, intricate and important which uh, many of us are waiting for with bated breath. Marion Furcad, uh, I, I should say myself particularly among these. Marion Furcad is the professor, a professor of sociology and also the director of the social science matrix at the University of California at Berkeley. And as I see the core of much of her work is the, I see it as being the complex relationship between on the one hand, economic categories, and then the other hand, the way in which markets actually function, as opposed to the idealized ways in which we often think that they do, and uh, how it is that categorization processes and markets intersect in order to shape different classes and to shape the real life opportunities that are open to individuals. So I think that this is something that uh, you sort of, uh, comes through in a lot of her work and which clearly co connects in very important ways to the uh, discussions and arguments that we're going to have today. Bill Janeway is at Warburg Pincus and is also at the Faculty of Economics at Cambridge University, where he has uh, recently been involved in the launch of the Janeway Institute. I uh, welcome uh, you to go and to look at their webpage. They are going to be doing many wonderful and interesting things, uh, studying the economy. And he also has been thinking uh, on, his, on his own behalf for a very long time about the intersection of three forces, effectively of uh, political, economic and uh, financial uh, forces and how they shape the long-term evolution of capitalism. Charlton McElwain is a uh, vice provost at New York University and is also uh, the professor of uh, media, culture and communications there. And his recent book, Black Software, does two important things. First of all, it identifies uh, an important uh, vanguard of black entrepreneurs, black thinkers, black doers who sought to try and uh, take the new technologies of the internet and to shape them in ways which um, sort of were more reflective of, uh, of their perspectives and of the uh, broader uh, cultural uh, perspectives of uh, America's black community. And on the other hand, uh, he also looks at how it is that uh, we saw uh, the advent of new algorithmic techniques, new forms of uh, data specification, of um, sort of uh, data analysis, which on the other hand, um, sort of had crucial consequences, for example, for policing and also for the uh, racial politics of the United States, uh, very often in a quite negative way for black communities. Zeynep Tufeki is in the School of Information at the University of North Carolina. 
Her book, Twitter and Tear Gas, was one of the first really systematic efforts to understand how it is that social media and politics intersect with each other. It's a book that all of us have read and have learned enormously from. Uh, those of you who have been following her over the last 18 months or so will know very well that she's been engaged in a very different set of questions. Uh, more or less, she found herself propelled into a new and perhaps somewhat unexpected role as somebody who was effectively building an interface between uh, academic, uh, scientific, and social scientific debates about the coronavirus pandemic and the public conversations and arguments that were being, uh, you know, being waged and sort of very often in uh, less informed ways. And uh, she has been um, somebody who has been at the forefront of trying to bring the two closer together. Although I uh, think from uh, reading her Twitter feed over the last few weeks that she is very much looking forward to getting back to uh, her core research Research after a long period of, you know, sort of what has to be only described as heroic and indeed Herculean public service. So these are a wonderful set of panelists who I think are going to come at these questions from a broad set of uh, perspectives and of sort of with a different, uh, with very different criticisms, very different understandings of the way forward. And I hope that the conversation that we have reflects this multiplicity of viewpoints. And so what we're talking about today here is high tech modernism. And those of you who read the paper that is again linked from the uh, event promotional page, we'll have a pretty good idea of what this involves. For those of you who haven't, the 30 second version is as follows. It builds on an idea from uh, James Scott, who wrote a uh, famous Among Social Scientists book uh, a number of years ago called uh, Seeing Like a State, which looked at the ways in which bureaucracies in the 19th and 20th century constructed categories uh, that they sought to use to try and understand the world, these abstract categories that strained out a lot of real life knowledge, and uh, in turn sought to impose these categories in their policies and in ways that they uh, sought to try and make the world more visible and more understandable to them. And this resulted uh, very often, according to Scott, in a pretty enormous policy tragedies. And so what the idea of high tech modernism is, is trying to do is try to understand the relationship between this world of 19th and 20th century bureaucracy and the 21st century world that we are entering into where algorithms and data play a, a crucial role in governance decisions, both in market and in uh, the state. And the rough intuition here is that these uh, processes actually have a lot in common with the processes that Scott identified when he wrote Seeing Like a State under the uh, label of high modernism, but they also have some very, very crucial differences. And so one of the topics we'll be discussing today is the relationship between high modernism and high tech modernism, and what kinds of things we can possibly learn from this comparison. So with this, I'm going to pass over to the uh, speakers in just a moment. Each of the speakers is going to talk for a few minutes about uh, some major points that they want to uh, develop with respect to high-tech high high modernism. After each of the speakers has finished, we're then going to move to a uh, much more conversational format in which I will try as moderator to draw out as best as I can the conversation between the different perspectives that have been advanced. And I will try as I am doing this to uh, weave in as best as I can comments and uh, questions from people uh, in the audience for this event. And so if you want to participate, you should be able to find uh, in your Zoom, you can use the questions and answers function in order to ask questions. What I would say is to try to keep the questions as succinct and precise as possible. I will try to weave them in as best as I can to the uh, debate and to the discussion, asking the panelists. Uh, I will say that depending on the volume of questions, I may not be able to get to all of them, but if I don't get your question, please do feel assured that uh, the panel will have an opportunity to read it and reflect upon it afterwards. And so with that, I am going to uh, turn over to uh, Marion, after which we are going to go in alphabetical order through the uh, participants in the uh, panel. And uh, I hope uh, you enjoy this. This is going to be a great conversation. Thank you very much, Henry. And uh, as Henry just uh, mentioned, he and I wrote one of the think pieces that's uh, posted on the website and that actually provides the title for today's event. So we are very grateful for everyone's engagement today. Um, what I'll do is uh, next, I'll, I'll sketch out the core of our argument for, for the audience. 
So algorithms and especially machine learning algorithms are among the most important technologies governing our current social order. To use Mary Douglas's phrase, they do the classifying, that is, they sort and they slot. What are the social implications of this simple fact? Well, many people, particularly technologists themselves, want a prescriptive recipe. How can we make sure that these tools we do, will do no harm? And so there's a lively literature in philosophy, computer science, and law about how we can regulate and audit algorithms or how we can bend their design to our ethical or political will. But the question from the social sciences is often different. They will ask, how do algorithms concretely govern? How do they compare to previous modes of government? And importantly, how does their mediation shape our moral intuitions and our political possibilities? So our piece, as uh, Henry mentioned, is inspired by James Scott's book, Seeing Like a State, a critique of what Scott calls high modernist bureaucracies. High modernist institutions and expert systems organize the world in ways that make it legible and prepare it for intervention. In the process, Scott says, they abstract away a lot of useful information. They function in an autocratic, top-down manner, trampling on local knowledge and lived experience. But the very visibility of their actions means that those so governed often respond to the way they are seen. Sometimes they conform to these ways, these categories, sometimes they grow into them, and sometimes they loudly contest them. Now, algorithms have the same fundamental goal to organize the world so it can be governed. In other words, they are a form of bureaucracy, which we call high-tech modernism, but they govern differently. Instead of stripping away valuable information, they swallow up everything they can, that is everything that can be made available through digital means. More information if we follow Scott ought to be a good thing. The problem is, the categories that result from the new optimization processes are different. You know, they are emergent, they are bespoke, they are multi often multidimensional and dynamic. They change over time. You know, they are constantly changed through feedback processes. For the government, of course, this is politically baffling. They cannot penetrate the mechanisms that manage their lives, not because they are secret, which they obviously are, but because they cannot be made intelligible. Nonetheless, the government must orient themselves to these mechanisms because their life chances depend on them. You know, you can think of the ability to cross a border, to obtain credit, to be visible on social media. This produces a very particular kind of moral economy. People are incited to ma make themselves fit for various kinds of sorting processes, even though they don't really know how to do so. So in fact, the divination of the algorithm has replaced the arbitrariness of the bureaucrat. Now, by making people visible and comparable as individuals, algorithms also make it difficult to see in algorithmic outcomes the operation of various structural forces, such as the force of the class, gender, or racial structure. They also make it difficult for those who are sorted to coordinate around a common fate. Instead, high-tech modernism institutionalizes the notion that processes of social sorting are nothing but the outcome of a healthy, even meritocratic form of competition. Of course, social scientists know better. Individuals cannot be so easily disentangled from the social structure. And in practice, what we find you know, is that fine-grained splitting, for instance, along some continuous rescale, tends to lump back to reveal the operation of well-entrenched inequalities and prejudices. Now, that of course does not mean that nothing has changed in this transition. To realize its technical vision, high-tech modernism must double down on ingesting ever greater quantities of individual level data intruding ever deeper into people's lives and habituating everyone to mundane surveillance and transparency. Second, it must implement the suppression of anything that stands behind, between the algorithm and the individual. 
Nowhere has this libertarian fantasy played out more vividly than in the public sphere. There, everyone must search for themselves. Anyone can offer content. Anyone can be their own expert. And it is again up to the algorithm, which has been conveniently optimized for profit, to sort it out. The mediation of organized knowledge and high modernist elites like the professions is downgraded as inefficient, inconsistent, and undemocratic. Not, of course, that the critique is, was ent is entirely unwarranted, but you know, the new government's regime obscures the fact that it too depends on organized mediations, things like echo chambers, viral trends, or click forms. And perhaps you know, the ultimate irony of the moral economy of high-tech modernism is that in fact it sanctifies a form of market fairness and the judgment of crowds for everyone, but in fact, it is loath to subject itself to, the, to their sanction. And so maybe others will have more to say on this. I'll just stop here. Thank you. Dana. First, you know, thank you, Henry. Thank you, Marianne. Like the ability to give us a framework to talk about high-tech modernism and for us to have this conversation and debate is such a delight. And I'm honored to be here. Thanks to everyone for joining us. As I've been thinking about what you know, Henry and Marion are trying to play with, I keep coming back to one of the challenges that I think are missing from their conversation, and that has to do with networks and the role of networks in this particular configuration. You know, as Marianne just told us, right, we think of machine learning as tools that, you know, sort and slot, but this is not neutral and this is not objective because those algorithms are socially constructed in order to create certain kinds of abstractions that are dependent on logics that are rooted within computing. They are, after all, tools serving different kinds of purposes. Machine learning does not inherently produce categories, but it often reifies them. And the reason it reifies them is because many ML systems are designed to identify the minimum cuts within networks of data and splice that information into discrete categories. Now, what that means is that machine learning systems see structure. They see structure within a network, how information relates to other forms of information, but without any sense of content, without any sense of meaning. So as a result, machine learning algorithms often identify structures that have been socially constructed, the very categories that were produced by high modernism, and then reifies and cements and further entrenches them. And for example, this is how a search engine learns race. It's not that this is a neutral category that has been, you know, that the machine learning system is looking for. It is one that was socially structured and one that affects in every aspect of our, our networks and our information. And so when machine learning is starting to cut information across networks, it sees those categories. It's also why we see autocomplete mechanisms starting to quote unquote know gender. It's not again that these are intrinsic, they're part of the structure. So this is where we have to ask ourselves of what it means to make it difficult to organize around, co around categories, because in many ways, it's not just that, you know, technology operates relationally by navigating networks, so do people. People have been put into categories by the state, by bureaucracy, by high modernism, but people have also wrapped their identities around those categories, embracing them in ways that calcify the categories while trying to resist the structures and the powers of the state. People live relationally. They live relationally to one another and to the social structures that we create all around them, including the machine learning algorithms we're talking about today. Now, of course, the power and the danger of high-tech systems stems from its tendency to structure those networks in particular ways for particular forms of power. Those who control the networks control how the structures operate. And just as machine learning cuts networks not into dense and discrete categories, so too does high tech structures try to segment people into separate worlds. And that separation has social costs. Just as though the bureaucracy was able to keep people in and out of the institution, network structures allow people to be cut across different kinds of network graphs. And that means that we start to see things like polarization and extremism. Because polarization and extremism actually come within the structure of the network. When networks are cut so that people do not have the relational formation that allows them to bond together. And so when those cuts are at their weakest, when they happen and create and reify structural holes, those structural holes become caverns that would normally be bridged through social processes. But they are not bridged here because there is no incentive to bridge them within such a structure. 
And that's where we have to look at the role of power in these systems, because this is not hierarchical power. Power within networks forms differently. One way to think of it is a centrality power, who has the ability to control a broader sense of relations. And of course, big tech companies who control these structures have tremendous power, but not through traditional modes, which is why they don't see themselves as powerful, because they're not looking at it with regards, or they're not actually functioning in a hierarchical sense. Their power stems from their ability to make and remake and structure the networks, to control the flow of information, to structure the graph as they see fit. This is what Manuel Castells has long argued is called network power. And so it's not just the moral economy that's being remade here. It's also the financial economy. Hierarchical power is about boundary work. It's about restricting access to information. It's about creating bridges who can broker information. But economically oriented network power in the conversation that we're talking about, about high tech modernism, is about maximizing the flow of information and profiting off of the flow of that, being able to sit as an arbiter of the structure itself. So it's a form of scale, but not the scale of a message, as we would think of in, in high modernism, but the scale of the transactions, the scale of the intermediate flows. And that is why surveillance becomes normalized and it becomes part of the system, because surveillance is critical to the structuring of the networks, and it is critical for being able to maximize one's position in relationship to the flow. And that, of course, gets us back to where the moral economy fits in. When network power is the core orientation within a capitalist society, this means scale is the currency. We have seen this through venture capital. We have seen this through the idea that we have a handful of players trying to maximize their position. It's not to simply assert hierarchical control, although often that's a byproduct of it, but to ensure that no other actor can achieve meaningful centrality. It is about maintaining control over the network, not just maintaining capital control. Now, of course, unchecked, the problem with this structure is it will lead to greater inequity than even traditional hierarchical power. Because when you can control the network and you control the flow of information, what ends up happening is not just about who's in or who's out, but who is in proximity in different ways to different opportunities uh, in ways that end up controlling things. So this is where, as, I, as we think about you know, the rest of this conversation, I invite all of you to think about where networks fit into all of this. Thanks. Fantastic. Bill. Thank you very much, Henry, and truly delighted to be part of this conversation with such, such thoughtful and stimulating fellow discussants. Um, I'm actually going to stand back a little bit from immediately addressing high-tech modernism because of its place in the context of the term that we use of a moral political economy. And that's because in critical ways, that moral political economy is in process of transformation. And I may sound um, in the context of this conversation a little unusual to say that I'm bringing good news. The, the constructs of high-tech modernism, the algorithms, the networks, the central power of big tech have emerged out of a long generation of a particular moral political economy, one uh, defined conventionally as, quote, neoliberal, but rooted in a set of economic propositions, propositions developed and propagated by economists to define the appropriate roles of market and state, and indeed maximizing the domain of the market and minimizing and delegitimizing the role of the state. One particular uh, expression of that, of course, was Section 230 of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which liberates those who are the uh, controlling central forces of the networks of which Dana talked and are the sources of the algorithms that animate this high-tech modernism to it fundamentally exempt them from the kind of oversight, the kind of political uh, state oversight and regulation that had evolved previously over the course of the 20th century from the introduction of broadcast radio in the 1920s right through uh, till 
uh, roughly the 1980, late, mid late 1980s and 90s. Um, well, that the fundamental foundations of that political economy are in process of being radically overhauled uh, from within the discipline of economics. In fact, before the global financial crisis, which represented the mega visible inescapable shock to neoliberal economics and the economic policies or the lack of thereof that it had sponsored, <clears throat> there was an emerging body uh, of microeconomic work of significance and of recognized significance. Uh, the, the Nobel Prizes of Economics in 2001, 2002, and 2006 uh, are worth taking a moment to consider uh, because the work that was done there, all of which was available, as I say, was recognized in the highest way possible within the profession, um, stands available today uh, for a contrib contributing to the construction of this new moral political economy within which it becomes possible actively to address the, um, the high tech modernism that's the subject of this, of this conversation. And in a way it's just bad luck for big tech that its power has uh, been uh, amassed at such a time as when the context in which that power is observed and may be addressed has, has changed. 2001 was the Nobel Prize for Danny Kahneman for behavioral economics. 2002 was for George Akerlof, Mike Spence, and Joe Stiglitz on the economics of innovation of the manner in which markets fail, the different ways markets fail because information is not neutral and is not commonly shared amongst all market participants. And in 2006 to Ned Phelps, uh, for, the rec for the analysis of how expectations can be inconsistent, in fact, can be assumed to be inconsistent as the default, in turn leading to market failure. With these sources of market failure all combining to um, effectively liquidate, finally, the late unlamented rational representative agent as the touchstone of a caricature of economics that unfortunately was carried over to too many of the other social sciences by economic um, economist imperialists, not all from the University of Chicago by any means. So the point here is that the, the stage is being set for an intellectual reconstruction of the intellectual frame with which it becomes possible to consider alternative ways to contest, to constrain, to regulate the sources and the consequences of high-tech modernism in a way that was simply not available 15, 10 years ago. And I think that this can inform our discussion uh, of, if you like, the pragmatics of dealing with high-tech modernism in, a, in an open and constructive way, as I say, that, that, that has a reach and a relevance, uh, most recently, I mean, right today, demonstrated by the content of the Biden administration's economic proposals, both for physical and human infrastructure uh, investment. Uh, again, uh, programs that were simply not conceivable as practical politics even if they're contested and divisive to an extent today, they weren't even conceivable a decade ago. This is a very encouraging environment, I believe. And with that, I'll stop. Carlton. Thank you and uh, thanks as well for this opportunity to, to weigh in on this conversation and to uh, think about a very thoughtful uh, piece that you all um, produced, Henry, and. Uh, Marion to help us uh, stimulate our thinking in this way. Um, my opening comments really, number one, they extend a bit in the same direction uh, as Dana's and focus on uh, 
the aspect of uh, the category and categorization in um, in your uh, formulation. Um, and for me, uh, there was there was a quote, a historical quote that kept coming to my mind uh, that I think animates and summarizes in a lot of uh, ways. Uh, much of my thoughts as I read through and engaged with um, the ideas in the paper. Um, so I'll, I'll read that and share a little bit about why I think that uh, sort of reflects some of uh, my response and thinking here. It's a quote by uh, a former Harlem, New York Congressman, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Uh, it's from 1960. Uh, and it was from a crowd uh, address that he was um, engaging with of the NAACP. Uh, so activists who were uh, gathered in part to hear him talk about computer automation and its intersection and implications on the labor market at the time. And he opened his comments saying this, he said, I shall not quote statistics. To do so would be a waste of your time and that of my staff. We know that the Afro-American is the last hired, first fired. We know that he pays a tax on being black, which makes him the lowest wage earner in the nature, in the nation. We know that he is quarantined, regardless of ability and education, so that his highest achievement can be the attainment of only creature comforts. We know that he comp composes the largest number of unemployed in this nation today. And we know that the new era of automation does not include him. And so to me, when we think about the role of categories in the formulation or distinctions between high and high-tech modernism, uh, they made me constantly come back to this uh, quote, and I think something that lies at the center of uh, Powell's points. And so I'll um, uh, articulate these into two uh, points that really have to do with the some of the premises of um, the works and the author's uh, arguments, uh, and not uh, not so much about the overall argument, which I think we are certainly in agreement with. But a couple of the premises and really premises having to do with the category. And so the two points I would make are first, that the category uh, and their respective hierarchy, hierarchies precedes the algorithm. That rather than high-tech modernism producing new algorithms that spawn new categories, that become new potential sites for visibility, recognition, contention, and debate, that they continue to latch on to the most strident, the persistent and salient of those categories that have come to define our society, both within and beyond the context of market economies. Um, as an example that perhaps we'll get into later, yesterday's over redlining and today's algorithmically derived reverse redlining result in the same categories of people being locked out of uh, opportunity to buy into the American dream which is perhaps a way to say um, in a different way that when it comes to some categories, there is no magic uh, in or reason to put faith in the liberatory power of algorithms. Um, and um, all right, I'll leave it at, at that for the first. The second uh, point I will make uh, is that not all categories are treated equally. Uh, and so particularly with respect to thinking about human agency, um, there is a quote in the paper that says, conscious agency is only possible where people know about the classifications. And yet I would contend that when it comes to racial classifications in particular, particular, whether that be of black people as black or African-American or otherwise indigenous people, those with CDIB cards or those with only folk ancestral histories, Latinos as Hispanic or white or Latinx or other ways of categorizing, we all have become quite aware of our imposed and lived classifications for some time. And the salience of these categories, while they may take a different form, are in my view no less visible or salient translated through algorithms. And so it's their persistence uh, or their persistent salience, uh, either through the bureaucracy or through algorithm, has not yielded much difference in terms of the agency derived uh, to resist the categories or their implications. And so all of this is to say that some categories remain salient and salient in the same way between the bureaucratic hierarchies of high modernism and the so-called flat landscape created by high-tech modernism's algorithms. And I'll leave it there for now. Zainab. Hello, hello. Um, so thank you again for um, inviting me here, as you said. So happy to be talking about something else. But 
I wanted to sort of go back to one thing that I know we have um, talked about. I think this might be work. So I, I, I think people can see this now. This is um, a figure uh, I'm talking, uh, I talked about in our emails. This is from the Seeing Like a State. And on the, I guess the left, if you're looking at a screen, is the managed uh, forest in Tuscany. And on the right is like a regular, normal, non-managed natural forest that has been cut for uh, potentially for timber or other things, but has been left to grow on its own. So back to this thing. So the, one of the key t themes on um, Scott's book, uh, one of my favorites, is um, the administrative ordering and structuring of nature and society in order to make it legible to those um, structures of governance, which also end up classifying and then discriminating and all the other things we talk about. And Scott gives examples ranging from obviously public health and things like that. So it's not, it's not presented as purely as an oppressive um, regime, but clearly the project of modernity. Uh, to make things readable and legible to those in power and governance for reshape it. So, and a lot of people have talked about some of the implications of this and what happens when we reify some of those categories and all of those things. So I think those are all super fascinating, but I'm really interested in this particular twist in that with machine learning and the, also the corresponding and preceding digitization of so many things around us, not just the internet, but you know, carrying phones, gyroscopes in our phones, everything we do online, there has been this incredible production of data, just um, points, information, bits, everything that can be fed into these machine learning algorithms that can do the process of making legible for the purpose of optimization without having to plant those trees in those nice little um, corridors, uh, which changes, I think, both the scale and the scope and the power and the operation of the project of modernity in many ways. So if you think about like from a tech example, one of the things that a database might need to do is ask you for your gender, ask you for your race ask you for those things so that you know you get fed into a vaccination statistic at the end of the day or something like that these are very much within the line of uh, Scott's sort of ideal with or without technology it's what we understand from this but with machine learning you can have a classification uh, that is based on not necessarily even the categories you think are relevant but just an optimization project who should we give money to uh, as credit and who we should not, or you know, a million other examples, which MRI is uh, the high risk one, which person is, which piece of information should we show or which post should we show a person to keep them engaged in our uh, screen and do that work without the plowing of the land. You can just let it grow in the natural form that Scott has and still use that incredible amount of data to optimize. Now, in fact, if anything, if uh, you look at the history of machine learning as a technical project, it's there since nine, I, I, right after World War II, people start trying to use it um, to do classification as a system, you know, just using the basic linear algebra and all the things that go into it. And for a long time, it flops. It like doesn't work well to optimize or categorize. And uh, the breakthrough comes not that long ago, around 2012. In fact, so recent that I remember seeing one of the first papers that broke it open for people, which was the, uh, I think Dean and Eng, uh, the Google paper, the, I always call it the cat paper, where they took the, uh, where they took about a million, um, little pixel images from YouTube and let the machine learning figure out, you know, classify things. And it came out with a cat. It, it rec We knew it was a cat because we could recognize that a cat, but it isolated an image uh, 
of a cat from these fairly low res, like 100 by 100 pixels. And nobody had taught it anything of the sort. And all of a sudden, people were like, wait, we can do all these things with machine learning, which wasn't seen as that promising. And there were some, you know, uh, technical twists and turns, but whatever else, you know, the back propagation, everything else, the crucial development was the amount of data, right? This incredible amount of data that allowed um, these algorithms to work. Now, I think this is important because many of the resistance, many of the forms of regulating and many of the things of um, shaping the project of high modernity, either as trying to make it function better for society or just to resist it, are based on the idea that you trip up these um, ordering, the administrative ordering, or you hide from it. Scott's book has uh, people hiding in the high, uh, the highlands of Vietnam to escape the sort of the colonization or the bureaucratic state, or do you have all these laws about what you can categorize people in which categories you can discriminate against and which are in law protected categories that you're not supposed to and et cetera. With machine learning, all of a sudden, you can um, do things like take people's Instagram posts and use that in hiring decisions. There's nothing, there's no law that I know that stops anyone from doing that, even though uh, that sort of kind of processing, optimizing will discriminate in some ways and not in others. And some of them will be familiar to us, like if it's gender or if it's race, we'll be able to post hoc, go back and see it might have been doing this or that, but there's so many things it could be doing that we don't even totally understand, that we don't even know how to regulate because we don't understand. One of the things that I, examples I keep going back to is there's a lot of data on um, the predictive power of these algorithms in what we clinically measure as say depression or mania. You can look at people's Instagram posts and the machine learning algorithm has, um, fairly similar clinically validated predictive um, power for depression in the next three to six months, uh, also for mania. And you don't have to like, whatever else you think about depression or mania, it, I'm comparing it to what we use at the moment, which is the clinical questionnaires. The algorithm, just looking at the post is doing something at similar levels of prediction. But if you show the same photographs to people, they don't have the it's not something you can eyeball. So I can imagine all sorts of ways of discriminating and say employment that our employment laws have no idea how to deal with and people have no idea that that's even happening because if somebody asks you about, uh, if somebody, like if you do an interview and you sort of somebody asks you very pointed questions about a protected category, that's a hint. If you go and measure things and you see uh, women qualified according to some standard, you can objectively decide aren't being hired as much, you can make a decision. There's things if you can, like, if you can see, if they have to the administrative order it, you can also see into it in ways that our legal edifice has tried or people in opposition and social movements have tried to put on the agenda as something to pay attention to. Whereas with machine learning, I feel like it can be done without the administrative ordering that it requires. And sometimes just our laws have no, or our cultural resistance has no way of talking about it, let alone trying to resist that. And I think that kind of the, the technical power here is a bit to me like photography versus eyewitness. Like if you were trying to, um, find people based on eyewitness or description and you had no photography or digital or film imaging or anything like that, you could have ways of describing people. You could have ways of identifying if a, that was a person. It would be subject to all sorts of things, but it's what it would be. Whereas once you have a technology like photography, identifying people becomes a different thing. And then the next step you have facial recognition from you know, billion images, it becomes a different thing. So I would love for, ev I, for everything else people are saying, to also kind of go back to the, it changes the scale and scope of the high-tech modernism, uh, sorry, the, the high modernism as Scott envisioned it. And one of my favorite uh, 
books on that, which is also not a perfect book, is James Benninger's Control Revolution, where he dealt with the information technology as a development to control the burgeoning production and consumption markets as a way to try to get a handle on things that were becoming too big to try to uh, organized by traditional methods of analog computing or, or analog, uh, not computing, but analog filing and counting, and then you have the transition. So this is, I, I see it both as a part of that in that tradition, and also that it can do things in different ways and optimize in things that aren't in our cultural, social, political vocabulary that I think need to be brought in if we are to sort of wrap our minds around all of this. And I will um, leave that there. Okay, so there are some fantastic questions, some great criticisms that have come up. And uh, let me jump in. And what I'd like to do is to jump in uh, on the basis of a question from somebody in the audience, but to try and turn it so that it addresses, uh, first of all, uh, Charlton and Dana, and then maybe I uh, get to some of the points that Zeneb has just uh, raised. And so, the, uh, as I understood, both Charlton and Dana in different, different ways, they give us a sense of how it is that uh, much of what we're seeing at the moment is effectively old forms of systematic prejudice poured into new bottles. That is that uh, what we are seeing is the uh, reification or the, uh, you know, in a new form of forms of structural and systematic prejudice, which have been with us uh, for a long period of time. And that this is something which, uh, you know, which is really, it's a different version of an older problem. And so if you wanted to look at that, you know, then one possible question, which I think uh, arises from that, and maybe from the uh, Powell quote that uh, Charlton had in particular, is uh, does this mean that the old kinds of ways in which uh, pe people sought to organize against these forms of systematic prejudice uh, still work in this new algorithmic environment? Or do we need to look to new kinds of tools in order to push back, in order to create a better moral economy? And uh, getting to Zenith's uh, argument, which is about the broader ways in which machine learning perhaps redefines the uh, space, there's a question from a member of the audience which points to uh, Oscar Gandhi's notion of algorithmically defined groups uh, who uh, experience prejudice. And so on one interpretation, you might say that these algorithmically defined groups are very often going to be the kinds of groups of people who have uh, experienced prejudice uh, systematically in the past. On a Another, it could be that there are some forms of groups which are basically you know, sort of new groupings. They are uh, groupings which are discovered perhaps by some unsupervised machine learning process, which uh, categorizes people in ways that aren't necessarily linked to some systematic, you know, some obvious marker that helps these people to identify each other and to uh, work you know, together with each other, perhaps to push back against prejudice. And this might lead to a more um, sort of, uh, you know, a more pessimistic account of what the possibilities of uh, counteraction might be. So I would love to hear maybe uh, starting with Charlton, then Dana, and then Zenep. Uh, talking to this, and then uh, Marion, perhaps if you would like to uh, respond to uh, respond uh, in turn from the perspective of the paper. Yeah, it's, that's. Uh, I'll try to weave in a, a couple of things in the response here. I do think there is a sense in which we need different tools. I don't know that those tools need to be um, computational, algorithmic, uh, or technological um, in any way. Um, but I think there has to be something different, and that's where my, my point lies, which is, which is really around um, agency. That is, if we premise agency on the ability to know and have salient for us the categories and the ways they, in which they um, uh, negatively impact those who are categorized, uh, that's the sense, and that's the point I'm trying to make for some group of people has always been the case, has always been visible, has always been salient, um, and therefore been able to be the subject of both um, agency and action, some of which has been effective, much of which has not been uh, in certain respects. Um, and so I think that we need a different tool. I don't know what that um, is, but one observation I would make, and uh, Zainab brought this um, up, if we look at the distinction between um, algorithmic um, uh, derivations where I may not know 
what's gone into the algorithm, but I have recognized and identified the outcome and noticed that there is a disparate outcome or disparate impact or effect on a particular group of people and can therefore say, and this is how we have done traditionally to say, look, there is some sense of um, implicit uh, prejudice or stereotyping or discrimination that's going on. And that has been uh, for many years uh, taken up by the, the, the legal apparatus and the courts and been seen as uh, a good model or um, justification for saying that di discrimination has taken place. I think what we're starting to see is an erosion of uh, disparate impact theory that is going hand in hand with the growth of new algorithmic uh, systems that are producing discrimination uh, and uh, judges and so forth less amenable to these uh, as, uh, as evidence for uh, discrimination taking place. But yet for those impacted, um, that is the same. The, the impact is the same. The outcome is the same. It is familiar. But I think we need different grounds on which uh, to fight if for no other um, reason than the algorithmic um, evidence uh, no longer being an evidence for that type of discrimination. Hopefully that makes uh, sense to some degree. Thanks, Charles, and I'll pick up per Henry's uh, ordering. Um, so one of the things I would start with is the idea, and this is why I keep coming back to networks, right? Networks allow us to see that networks and groups don't fit comfortably together. Um, and that's true mathematically, but it's also true, true culturally and analytically. And what we have done over the last hundred years in trying to build cases, as Charlton pointed out, to build cases for anti-discrimination has started and centered on the idea of a group. And so we can demarcate who, groups and then we do a lot of boundary work. Who's in that group? Who's not in the group? What happens when the group doesn't actually work within a society? And that boundary work of grouping then allows us to make cases often statistically oriented to say, you know, is this disparate impact? That is a framework. And I think that that framework is very much failing right now. And the framework is failing because one of the things that we quickly learn with, with systems like, you know, algorithm systems, especially ML systems, is you can actually work around those requirements. You can work around those structures. You can ensure that you never tip over, for example, an equal, you know, employment opportunity um, requirement. You can make certain that you never tip over it. But does that mean that everybody is being treated equitably? Absolutely not. And I think this is where Charles and I completely agree, because I think that for many people, it is a new form of the same thing, but now with different language and with new, different ways of coping. And so because our systems actually bake in already existing structural inequities, many of the worst costs of this you know, are born to amongst those who are already you know, feeling the pain within a particular society on a particular issue. And that's one of the reasons why that is normally the challenge that people point out is like, look how these technologies reify those structures. And that is true. But that is also not going to always be true, which is why we do need different languages and new different frames. Because what's going to happen is that the systems are going to get a lot smarter. And if we don't figure out how to talk about inequity in the network, we're going to end up this moment where we're not going to have an ability to talk about it linguistically. I don't think we're there yet. So I think part of it is to think, you know, in, you know, removing ourselves away from categories rather than always putting ourselves back into categories, remove our way back out of categories and say, given someone's positionality within a structure, do they have an equitable opportunity for X? What are their access to their resources? Who do they have that they can turn to for you know, access? Do they have information? Where are they within that broader position? And right now, that is a way to look at it analytically, but we don't yet have the ability to structure that more holistically. It's one of my constant frustrations about the lack of statistics that allow us to understand networks. And the closest we get there is we get to start to have intersectional language. Right? Intersectional language allows us to see categories as they relate. But even when we think about categories as they relate, it's not just about adding up all the categories to understand, you know, who's in a position of, you know, subservience to a, a structural system. It's very much about understanding how these systems are entwined. And that's one of the reasons why I do think that the key to this is going to be moving away from our group-based models, because I don't think our group-based models can get us um, in, in response to these systems. But that doesn't mean that we are prepared for it. And I don't feel like we are. And I'll turn it to you, Zainab. Well, so much there. Um, I'm, I'm 
both I, i'm definitely agreeing with we need to change um the way we approach questions of discrimination and equity we, we don't have the conceptual or linguistic tools with it and one of the um sort of questions I get most, I think, sort of from the policy people has come from the finance side, partly because um, only there we have this uh, particular rule that if you are turned down for credit, you must be given an explanation, right? Whatever level it is, you're supposed to be given an explanation. Whereas, of course, with the machine learning systems, you can't, you, you're not given an explanation. And there are all these sort of, um, even with FICO, which is technically not known exactly what it is. It's kind of known what the weights are and what things are. And when you say somebody's FICO score is low, you can even sort of break it down and what's going on. So it fulfills the legal requirement, but there are all these um, schemes now to um, provide credit to people or access to people based on just sort of chewing through a lot of data in a non-traditional way and almost always machine learning and going through that. Now, the proponents of such systems will say, and it may even be correct, that in some ways they may be, um, they may have larger proportions of, say, black people who do get selected to be given credit, or women, or the, the things that the law protects, uh, 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 sees as uh, protected categories, and then, then they fail through that. But it might also be doing all sorts of things we do not understand. And if you're denied credit, it is really, there is no answer. What can I change to be uh, credit worthy? Just by definition almost doesn't have uh, an answer besides please the algorithm, but it's not really known if there's any particular thing you need to do to please the algorithm. And the questions for regulating such things often I get from legislatures or lawmakers is, well, we'll make them show us the code will make them like will force them into transparency which with machine learning is not going to give you anything you know google translate right now i think is like 500 lines of code uh, it can turn it over that's not where the classification is occurring it's that interaction between that large corpus of translated things you know billions of billions of stuff giant matrices and teeny little bit of code so they want to see the code because they're almost thinking like there's a FICO-like process there. They're going to look up and see the Wizard of Oz behind it. And I can totally see the company saying, okay, you know, we'll put you into a room and show you the code. Like we might not publish it and they might even make a case, blah, blah, blah. And they'll show the code. And then like, we haven't done a thing because the discriminated person or the person who's been turned down from credit, their answer remains, you must please the algorithm. It's this new deity that accept certain sacrifices and rejects others, but nobody's telling you what. It's this completely Kafkaesque thing. So in the name of rationality and further modernism, we are in the weirdest, almost sort of uh, millenarian religious moment where things get decided with not the programmers, not the data people, not the law people, not the person, like nobody can tell you what on earth just happened or what you must do to improve or get the outcome you want. And then there's this sort of uh, shaking of heads and shrugging, and then we move along. And I don't think this is tenable or desirable, even if it looks better in some of the categories we're used to measuring, like race or gender, which we have some sense of it. It could, like, I, I feel like what can be measured is the tip of the uh, iceberg of what might be going on in this big process we don't really understand and please the algorithm doesn't seem like a very good way to base uh, equity or fairness. All right that, that, this is all terrific. Um, I want to add something about you know where sort of this impulse is coming from is partly um, from an ambition, however twisted and problematic, you know, to get rid of the, you know, the, the most blatant forms of discrimination. And, you know, just sort of this idea that if you're going to use, um, if you can use sort of individual behavioral data, you know, somehow 
you're going to be able to sort of judge people, you know, underneath, you know, the problems of the social structure. And in some ways, it's, you know, it, it goes back to an old economic dream that, you know, if, you know, you must individualize, individualize, individualize. But of course, you know, any sociologists would know that all individual behavior is socially patterned. And for reasons that have to do with the way that it is being recorded, for, uh, for you know, the way that um, simply people act differently under a very different kind of opportunity structure. And so it is those differences, of course, that get them, you know, that get translated into what looks on the face of it like, you know, this individual behavior. And this is where the question of disparate impact comes, you know, comes in. Uh, this is where it becomes really problematic. Um, and, but I think it's important to understand that there is this sort of moral economy behind all of this, that you'll be able somehow to do this and that all you need to do is individualize more, you know, and you have to, and, and it is also what's um, pushing, I think, all of these firms and organizations to want to collect more and more data because there's this idea that somehow the answer is in more and more data. But of course it won't be, right? Of course it won't be because the social structure is still there, right? And it is there in everything that people do. And, uh, and especially in the way in which it is measured and categorized and individualized and so on. So I think that's the sort of fundamental problem at the core of this, right? Now, there is also the question of the, of sort of the, the politics of this. So, you know, we've talked about the fact that the politics may be, you know, it's very hard to orient yourself to sort of some, you know, to the category of, I don't know, people who have a credit score between 520 and 580 or something, you know, that's not really a category. In fact, a lot of the stuff that, you know, comes out is, is not categories in sort of the traditional sense. You may have categories that are, you know, actually is along some sort of continuum or scale, right? And so politically, because there's always this notion that, you know, things are always in movement, it becomes really hard to orient yourself to that. So you, of course, you have to fall back, you know, on the more traditional categories that we know, you know, feel the burden of this, this you know, these disparities more, more. But this is not to say that the other categories are irrelevant. They are. But they are, you know, like the low credit scorers or something, you know. This is, this is something, you know, it's happening. And it's, you know, if you have a low credit score, it might create all kinds of problems outside of finance, you know, in the housing market, in the labor market, perhaps, you know, uh, in the insurance market and so on. It may percolate in a lot of ways. So it has some sort of, you know, this, you know, what Gandhi calls this, algorithmically defined groups or categories do have also sort of an impact. Um, so that's sort of where I want to go. I mean, I think we're creating this sort of new form of meritocracies, but we don't know how to orient ourselves because we don't know what the, you know, what counts really as, as merit. I mean, I think as, as Zeynep really explained very well. So, uh, I, I know that uh, Bill would like to uh, respond to some of these questions as well. And I also want to ask him a more specific question, which is about the role of economic logic. Because, of course, when we're talking about po the politics of this, very often we think about resistance from beneath, but also the role of the state is pretty important. And antitrust is very often uh, the way in which uh, the state looks to uh, uh, to get involved in these markets or market-like processes. So I guess the question I have is, when we're thinking about these uh, major uh, questions from the perspective of economic 
theory and antitrust. Clearly economic theory, George Stigler and people in the 1960s helped shape the world that we're in. And I'd be interested in addition to whatever other comments you have about what's happened uh, so far, if you could talk a little bit about what kinds of possibilities there might be for antitrust, and then other people can uh, jump in on top of that as uh, they see fit. Thanks, Henry. Um, first, I just wanted to pick up on um, the manner in which Zainab correctly um, discussed how machine learning algorithms specifically play such a powerful role in the construction of the algorithms that, as Dana said, reify uh, categories. They don't just reify them, they legitimize them. Machine learning in the social world takes correlations and presents them as objective truth and presents them with a kind of implicit presumption that if you just study them closely enough, you will discover the causal relationship behind and underlying the correlations. And of course, the first law of big data is the more, the more data you have, the more the certainty that the, um, the more the certainty that false correlations, meaningless correlations will rise exponentially and that the challenge of extracting uh, causality from behind that sea of correlations um, is all the more difficult. Um, and this in a sense that it, for me is kind of, re the reductio absurdum is this incredible exponential increase in the number of parameters applied to natural language processing systems like GPT-3, which are still in the position of simply trying to predict out of the vast amounts of data they've consumed, what will be most likely to be the next word that a human being would use when the software itself has no idea what the words mean, either individually or jointly or strung together. Gary Marcus and Rodney Brooks provide excellent uh, critique of, of this sort of pretentiousness of machine learning world. But that also gets me around to where Dana has been talking about networks. As it happens, over the last really 10 to 15 years within economics, again, in this rich field of microeconomics that's been evolving uh, behind the caricature of the rational representative agent, an enormous amount of work has been going on to understand first how the economic system itself is a network of networks, how within those networks, those networks of production and distribution, uh, centrality and bottlenecks create the potential for concentrated market power. And concentrated market power then can be seen in the trade-off as a result of a trade-off between efficiency and resilience. And we have spent precisely in that long generation from when Stigler and Posner liquidated the intellectual basis for antitrust policy, we've seen the uh, triumph of efficiency in the construction of networks, that is least cost as the only criterion of merit, leading to radically reduced resilience as demonstrated most recently, of course, in the supply chain uh, crises that the pandemic uh, generated and revealed. So it's in that context, again, I say that the, the libertarian bros of Silicon Valley uh, have had terrible timing. It is the case that antitrust law is finding a new basis for legitimacy and antitrust practice is quite likely to follow. Uh, and that can be at the level of whether um, uh, Facebook can own, can, can have bought up and then sought to integrate uh, the data sources from what would have been potential, uh, what would have been potential competitors to the more uh, behavioral uh, abuses that were for many, many years 
the legitimate subject of the federal of an active federal trade commission, which is now perhaps again likely to become active. So uh, this this the antitrust question is very well um, embedded within this transformation of economics, which also, as I say, increasingly takes seriously the role of networks uh, as to how the world works and analyzing networks in order to identify sources of power that in turn may generate market failure on the one hand, social failure on the other hand, and legitimize political response. Okay, I want to bring in a question from the audience, uh, and uh, we're uh, going. To, we're coming towards the end, so if people can be as quick in their answers as possible, it would be wonderful. Uh, but somebody from the audience uh, points out that a lot of the uh, problem that we see today is of a kind of an, an environment, a physical environment uh, of the internet, which is being homogenized, rather like the plantations of trees that uh, Scott describes and seeing like the stations of you have these normalenbaum or whatever he calls them. But now we have this uh, huge infrastructures which are being run directly by Facebook, by uh, Google and by others, and which make it far more difficult for uh, actors to come from beneath and to change stuff and to uh, disrupt things in the way that at least in theory they were supposed to do. So uh, how do we deal with that kind of problem and with the other sources of power uh, that uh, people uh, identify as being uh, major, you know, major, major, major constraints that are perhaps some sort of making it more difficult to deal with this broader set of political problems? Dana. I mean, the thing that I would say about the tech platforms and the centrality that they've had in this whole conversation is this has everything to do with a particular arrangement of capitalism. Venture capitalists want a return on investment. There is no, like 20 years ago, there were countless technology companies that were starting without major VC. Now you can't get a restaurant started without VC. Like that is the state that many of this is in, such that the expectation is not just that you will become a profitable organization, but that you will continue to produce return on investment for your stockholders in many ways or funders in different ways until you collapse. And that kind of hockey stick growth, like I always joke that, you know, nothing grows at that speed other than cancer. Right. And that's where I think we are at right now is that we've created a cancerous structure because we expect return on investment at that scale. So if I could tie that to one more thing, uh, is that like, if all of this had happened in a different political uh, capitalism environment, of course, we would have had different things. But one of the things that uh, Dana's just talked about that's really crucial to this is this, this cash that's slushing around the global finance system without a place to go is a key driver of like everything we're talking about in many ways. And um, that at some point needs to come into the thing because you have that much venture capital money because yeah, you have all this cash slushing around. And what has happened is, you know, what the startup ecology is you know, just waiting to be purchased by Google or Facebook or one of those, like it's the echo higher thing. And as she said, that's, I think that's a pretty good way of saying it. You need VC to start a restaurant and then hopefully somebody will buy you out uh, and that's your uh, ticket. So that's part of the distorting process of, um, so it's gonna sound weird, but in some ways it is anti-innovative. It is genuinely anti-competitive in my view because whenever I talk to sort of my more edgy friends, including in these companies who have all sorts of ideas of things to do that might even at least on the margins and sometimes fundamentally transform some of these things or look into some of the black box problems or this or that, like why bother? Like there's nobody who seems even slightly motivated to bother because the game seems to be you tell a story to venture capitalists and you get money from them and then some big company buys you and then everything is the same way it is. And this can function to the degree there is this much excess lopsided cash uh, in the hands of few people that's looking for a place to go is distorting this whole thing. I do want to say one thing though to something that was said in terms of the um, causality link. I think I'm, I'm going to disagree a little bit here so we can spice up this discussion. Uh, I think one of the inflections we're seeing is that trying to look for causality in the mechanisms of intervention 
uh, is very much a 20th century thing that is being increasingly superseded by the optimization thing where you don't feel like you need to understand to intervene for good or bad and you just are presented with some of these things. So we're, we're not having the correlation causation being conflated problem. We're having this, we don't even care uh, and we don't really understand kind of moving away from it, which um, I can't like, as with all things, I can't say, oh, it's always terrible because you know, these things can read pap smears better than people and we don't know. Like I'm not, this is an interesting, we don't know why people read pap smears the way they do either. It's this weirdo art science-y things and the machine learning can do it. So it's not a, you know, 100% always terrible thing, but in some things, of course, the whole legitimization of society base is based on a theory of how society works and causality and what we're doing and what we're not doing and why so that people can have a political voice in the process and if you move, remove causality from the discussion you remove political voice as well uh, and i think that's a major problem um with like with oscar gandhi's the big sort kind of uh the book which is prescient and amazing and excellent and i can still read it and understand it which is amazing for that kind of book, right? Because usually books get outdated and his book is excellent even though it was written before Google was even founded. But my feeling is we've fallen behind it in terms of the politics of this discussion because of well, us move away from causality. I have, to, I have to say that I still care about causality partly because I care about political action in response to what's going on in markets. But uh, speaking as a venture capitalist, um, I, I, I want to make two quick points. First, um, 20 or 30 years ago, no significant computer company was started without a venture capitalist. You have to go back to Hewlett Packard uh, to find one. Um, what is interesting today is a moment in capitalism, which I think is arguably um, unprecedented as a consequence of the limited range of tools available to states in response to two successive mega shocks, the global financial crisis and the pandemic. The central banks of the world have done what they have never before done in peacetime. They've driven real interest rates, ex-inflation, to negative levels and generated incentives for exactly that flood of money that has come into the world of tech has, has overwhelmed, has, has almost drowned and forced some to come uh, and, and increase some venture capital firms uh, far beyond their capacity to actually function as professional venture capitalists. And they have funded in turn a, a business model, which is, you know, has been known as blip scaling. Uh, do not worry about your customers giving you enough money to develop and deliver something of value, a service, a good, something of economic value, of commercial value. Just rely on the ability to sell securities to investors. Um, this is producing, of course, a, a, a flood of companies uh, whose business models make those of the late 1990s of the dot-com bubble uh, seem almost rational, almost plausible, because these are completely out of control. Uh, there's an electric vehicle, electric truck company going public uh, to raise $10 billion at a $50 billion valuation uh, this week uh, with zero revenues and no particular reason to believe it will ever be able to pay its bills and of course, even at a trillion dollar valuation, uh, Tesla does not generate positive cash flow on an actual cash to cash versus a, a, a manipulated accounting basis. So this is a very unusual moment in the history of capitalism. And it does bear on the state of tech, the state of high tech and the state of high tech modernism. So uh, Charlton, in your book, you uh, try you talked about how the black entrepreneurs back in the 1990s looked to use uh, AOL and similar types of co uh, companies to jumpstart a 
broader sense of black community. So uh, given these problems, and given perhaps also what Dana said about how it is that structural holes between different communities are uh, have become caverns in a sense, what kinds of possibilities are there out there for bringing together uh, community and business models today? Or are these becoming more antithetical things? I think in a way they are becoming a little bit more antithetical. And I think it goes back to this question around antitrust and the size of the platforms and so forth, where when we think about scale and the scale of potential change, it's almost as if there is no other ground to effectively play on unless it's the, the ground of these major platforms, meaning um, it's hard for me to understand and see the possibility of change happening from the ground up or in uh, communities wherever they spawn, be that online or uh, quote unquote offline, uh, that has the possibility of the kinds of scale need, scale of change needed to really uh, transform this. And yet, you know, I think the irony and the tragedy um, is that in a moment post uh, George Floyd and so forth, these are also platforms offering to step in and fulfill that uh, or fill that gap and asking questions about what role can we play the platforms in making these um, uh, things more just and so forth. And I think it is a uh, tragedy that that becomes the site at which we have to play and engage and almost only one if we think about um, a kind of a change at a scale uh, that needs to be done to uh, effectively fight the scale of the problem as it's laid out. So we're coming towards the end of the session, but I was wondering, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, Marion, would you like to uh, jump in with any uh, broad thoughts to uh, tie this all together? I don't know if I can tie this all together. I, I actually wanted to uh, go back to, you know, the, the question of, of VC and the availability of cash and, you know, which I think really stands at the core of, uh, of what we're seeing today. And, you know, um, Bill mentioned, you know, the business model of blitz scaling, but, you know, how do you blitz scale? One of the things that I think is underappreciated is you know, the, the ability of this firm, precisely because they are backed up by so much cash to actually blitz scale without selling anything, you know, without really selling. That is, you know, blitz scaling by what, what I've called in other words, gift essentially, uh, that is offering free service and so on and enrolling people in this sort of very, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in this manner, but making it essentially too much of a good deal and too irresistible and so on and so forth. And that I think is, is you know, continues to be very important uh, in, uh, in Silicon Valley and in this, you know, in the structuring of digital capitalism. We see it, we saw it actually happening during the pandemic, you know, with sort of this, you know, um, dozens of, of hundreds of of educational apps that you know uh, teachers can download and kids can download and so on for free and you know and then you know once you have established yourself you know this is when you you know this is when you move to a to a, a monetized model um, and so I think there's a dynamic here uh, which is a network dynamic that you know Dana was talking about very much you know at the beginning of this that uh, that is uh, um, that is at the core uh, you know that is actually relying on a very human kind of sociality and and the uh, sort of this human impulse to reciprocity and to you know um, take part collectively in things um, and so this is where sort of the economy for me and, uh, and, and the economic and the social actually meet, you know, in this sort of irresistible dynamic of the, of the, of the gift and the social, you know, and the social structure that stands behind it. Well, this has just been a fantastic conversation. Just sorry, just making sure that I'm not uh, that I'm not muted. And I just would like to point in passing: uh, people who are interested in the uh, importance of uh, ready access uh, to money as a constraint or not as a constraint. This is a major theme of uh, Bill's book, which went into its second edition a few years ago. 
uh, and how it um, shapes the uh, economy. But I think one of the things that has really come across to me from this wonderful conversation is the crucial importance of bringing together, on the one hand, the kinds of conversations that people are having about new media, and on the other hand, social sciences, uh, because there really has not been nearly as much of that conversation as you might expect. Social scientists, uh, with some important exceptions, have not paid nearly as much attention to these uh, dynamics as they ought to. And uh, the uh, result has been that I think that it has been an impoverishment of social science dialogue and also a difficulty in confronting the really big structural questions that are ra raised by this new world of algorithms, by this new world of business models and how they are reshaping the world. So this has been a wonderful conversation, but I feel like it's kind of a taster for a much bigger and much broader conversation that ought to be happening around us. And I'm just delighted that we've had uh, such wonderful participation from people who are really engaged in this debate uh, at an extremely high level. And I look forward, I really hope that we see more work coming out of this conversation and as we're returning to these themes from a variety of different perspectives, arguing out uh, in a broader sense, uh, these are very, very important questions. So thank you all for participating. And I also want to thank again, the uh, sponsors of this event, uh, the co-sponsors, Data and Society, the Essex Society and Technology Hub at Stanford, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, uh, and the Social Science Matrix at University of California at Berkeley. And finally, I want to give you a heads up, which is that this is, of course, uh, one in a series of talks. You can go back and you can see uh, many other talks in this series on YouTube. There will be more coming up. And in just a few seconds, you're going to see a uh, screen coming up, uh, uh, if you're in the audience, uh, describing the social science for a world in crisis series and giving you a sense of the other things that you can uh, find in this uh, set of debates that has been happening. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to the panelists. And thank you uh, all for joining us today.